Once again, welcome to Sustainable Based, uh, Sustainable Community Based Systems for Device Deployment and Digital Skills Programs. My name is Deanne Cuellar. I'm the Associate Director for Outreach at the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. Next slide. We have a lot to cover today, so this agenda is abbreviated, but just we're going to do a welcome introduction of some special guests. We'll be going into device deployment. We'll be going a little deep dive in programming. And then I'll talk at length about co-designing your digital opportunity solutions. And then we'll reserve the rest of the time today for our practical application and Q&A session. Next slide. Before we get started, I want to let you know that we are joined today by um, Monica Gonzalez with the Methods Healthcare Ministries. We will be having um, members of the Harris County Broadband Office from up there. We'll have uh, some folks from uh, Community Technology Network up in Austin. We'll also be joined by a couple device deployment program representatives. So we actually have members from our ecosystem from Texas and also digital practitioners that do this work, all in the hopes of talking to you all today about the subject and answering your questions and helping you move through some roadblocks. I've gone ahead and created a new graphic for what we often refer to as the three legs of the stool. I was trying to come up with something a little bit more inclusive. So instead I've made this and what it is is that you hear often about digital equity work or like a heavy focus on infrastructure. It's because the infrastructure, the actual internet access is a precondition for closing the digital divide. So one leg of the stool as they refer to it is having fast and reliable internet connectivity. The other is having access to a high quality device, a device that can actually connect to the internet and can be used for things outside of what a smartphone would use. So you can't do telehealth medicine as easily um, on a tablet or a phone. If, um, if you had a desktop computer, you'd be able to sit and you would be able to like position it differently. So there's different accessibility uses with having a high quality device. And then regardless of you having a smartphone or the tablet, or the laptop or the desktop PC, you still have to have the digital skills to have them. And I would add to the digital skills that it's not just also about the curriculum, like within the digital skills curriculum that is created for a specific cover population, you have to also be considering like the accessibility and um, the cultural competence of that digital skills curriculum or program. We'll get into that a little bit later. Next slide. Always referring to the uh, TDOP, um, there are, um, if you go into the TDOP, especially if you do deep dive into the appendixes, there will be um, information and um, statistics from respondents that were surveyed during the creation of the Texas Digital Opportunity Plan. So I've highlighted some of them um, here today. One of them that we I wanted to point out specifically, because we're not going to go through all of them, is that as you begin to co-design solutions for unhoused individuals, low-income individuals, um, people with limited English proficiency, you will see the numbers uh, get larger. Um, they will get they'll be get bigger. So it is it would not be uncommon if you're working with uh, the unhoused population for them to have uh, be more reliant on a smartphone versus being more reliant on a laptop because of their the their current like experience that they're living through. Uh, so just be mindful of that and please refer to the TDOP information because the, the numbers um, that represent the respondents of the people that were surveyed can really help you um, have conversations with stakeholders and the community partners that you might be working with that work directly with these populations if you are designing a device, digital skills, programming um, solution for your community. We also wanna note that as always, these are clickable. But I wanted to note that DigiUnity um, has a great interactive map on device gaps that you could refer to if you're looking for a resource. Next slide. For those of you just now joining us, please drop your name and your organization. And also uh, be mindful of the poll that we need you all to take for us today. If you haven't, it should be up. Um, we're going to begin today with de device deployment strategies. We'll call it device deployment strategies because just buying a device or a, let's say, um, let's say you have 200 uh, participants of a digital skills program and you buy 200 devices. It's not as simple as just buying devices and they fly out and they reach the people that they're supposed to be reaching. You have to be thinking through the approach of like how you're gonna get a device to the target cover population you're trying to reach. So an example would be during 
COVID, during the pandemic, many of the older adults throughout the country were not just uh, um, isolated because of the pandemic, but there were many old, like many like high populations of older adults were socially isolated older adults. They were all adults that were already not leaving their housing pre-pandemic for other reasons. So if you were purchasing devices connected to the internet and you were trying to get them to the older adults, you would have had to think through the logistics of getting that device into the hands of an older adult that might not have internet access or the device or the digital skills um, to use them. Um, so that's just a, that's one example of a community based approach. Another like refurb versus new. I really wanted to put this here today. We're not going to have a debate about like refurb versus new, but there are um, organizations that refurb, refurbish. They take previously used computers and they will um, they will put them back together if they need to, or they will uh, erase the memory and, and make it to where it has the software to where the computer can be reused and be redeployed back out to the community. And the way that organizations um, receive and deploy reverb, refurb devices is looks different. And there are different models, like meaning there are different models for like a nonprofit, there are different earned income, like there are for-profit models to do this. Um, and, and then how organizations like interact with a refurb device program will look different depending on which one you choose for your community. Using refurb is also a great, it's a great way to work in um, an alliance with those who are working on, you know, around like um, recycle issues or in, or in your community that, that's, it's attributed to that. Um, it, it could be also cost savings for a program that doesn't have the funding to buy all new devices. So there are lots of things to think through with refurb. Um, new versus new. There is also a lot of specs and recommend, recommendations around why uh, organizations choose new over refurbish. So you would want to also look into that. So for example, older adults technology services chooses only to use new devices. And so if you uh, work with that organization and you go to their website, they have lots of research and studies um, and they have uh, technology recommendations um, that outlines why they would prefer and choose to use new devices versus refurbish. And you can study those there. And then there's when you get to uh, devices, there's a discussion that you um, many people in the community stakeholders have around, do you lend the device or do you just give them device? And again, these are not debate. This is just for comparison. But there are um, there are reasons why an, an organization chooses to lend a device. It has its own purpose and meaning and outcomes for that. And then there are reasons why devices are deployed and they they remain in the hands of that person. Um, there's there's also a lot of concerns around lending versus ownership because of how do you manage the device? How do you keep track of the device? Um, you know, do you do you uh, do you map where the device is? There's privacy issues on there. Do you, when you lend a device, do you filter it because it's going to a household with children and adults? Um, is the is the device that you're lending is it open to be used by the student and the parent? Um, if uh, ownership, also um, some programs that are doing digital um, opportunity programs, they don't want to see the device back, and we we have an example um, of that. Uh, today. And then you'll see uh, this picture right here. This is from here in the um, city of San Antonio. We had massive device deployment uh, programs and it that was a, a hybrid. We had both. We had devices um, that were lent out and we had devices that were, were given away and they were to remain in the hands of um, the people that received them. And then the other one, there are many, but the other one too that you always want to be thinking through with all of these device deployment strategies is accessibility. So an older adult that has a stroke, uh, has experienced a stroke, would interact with the device differently than an older adult that would not. And then um, you then if you're working with um, other communities living with disabilities, um, you know, hearing, you know, those with hearing impaired, sight impaired, you um, are going to have different accessibility options um, on those devices. The software is going to look different. Um, the peripherals, all the other supplies that go with the devices are also going to look different. And another example of that is if um, you go to um, 
Houston's Easter Seals program, there's a lot of information about the different types of accessibility designs that they've incorporated into their program. Next slide. Um, so here we're going to get into um, the types of programs that I mentioned. I brought up OATS. Um, we brought Harris County. We have Monica from MHM that we're going to talk to a little bit. Um, MHM has launched this wonderful uh, digital equity grantee cohort. It is awesome. I got to sit in um, to see and learn a little bit more about it. I'm participating in it. Um, it's a statewide strategy to get, you know, our most vulnerable um, communities, um, you know, connected in Spanish and in English. We've also got other examples like CompuDopt, Computers for the Blind, and Austin Freenet. There are many other successful initiatives. If I didn't let, mention you, it's because I have so many slides to get through today. Um, but when these uh, slides go out, I'll make sure that these links are all clickable. I also want you to spend a little bit of time reading this um, clipping from the San Antonio Express News because I think it speaks to the work that um, that the work of best practices that are out there that communities can replicate. Rosemary Kowalski and Pat Hauso are two very well-respected older adults in the Barrow County community have spent a lifetime making this community um, better. And what I loved is that they wrote this op-ed um, during the pandemic um, and published it to, to remind the community and those that were in decision-making positions, the importance of interacting with older adults when designing solutions and about the kinds of programs that should be being considered when you want to really recruit and engage with the um, with the older adult um, pop, uh, populations in our community. So at the time, we had estimated that there were over 120,000 older adults we needed to reach in the city of San Antonio, um, which, either whether it's older adults or incarcerated individuals or K through 12 students, whether it's the device deployment or other parts of your program, you should be engaging with those communities at length about the kinds of solutions that you're thinking about making investments in. Next slide. Um, here is an example. I thought that uh, Monica was up next. I guess I had this first. Um, here is a, a little slide or a big slide about, about the uh, device deployment strategies in Harris County. Uh, I really encourage you to go to their website. I think we have Francisco on the call today, right, Francisco? Yes. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, John okay. Spears, uh, program manager, is also on call. I oh, great. Okay, good. Um, John Spears and Francisco are with um, Harris County. Uh, they are spearheading this work up there. They, um, John Spears also is a, you know, a longtime digital inclusion practitioner. Um, John, did you want to go really quickly and talk a little bit about the key takeaways from y'all's program? I know we talked about, I wanted, I wanted people to understand like the, uh, the size of um, the ECF grant that Harris County received and the amount of devices that they um, deployed to the community. Absolutely, thanks so much, uh, Deanne, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, Harris County uh, received uh, the most funding under the Emergency Connectivity Fund, uh, $41 million for the, the purchase and distribution of uh, 55,000 devices to residents um, that had a digital access need. Um, 40,000 of those were um, Chromebooks and 15,000 um, were uh, tablets that were available to um, residents as well. And the connected Chromebooks really were uh, uh, the, the result of the iterative process that was developed for um, improving the distribution process so that the residents could better utilize and benefit from the technology. Um, there were insights gained from the phase one distribution that the devices um, when standalone, uh, as standalone hotspots uh, were complex and uh, did not necessarily lend themselves to a higher use rate. And so that's something that this internet enabled device concept is one that has um, a greater significance to those that are using the technology. Um, and through the iterative process as well, uh, really determining that digital training needs to be a component of any distribution process. And that's something that 
Um, at the time, uh, the Harris County Public Library benefited from a Texas State Library Archives Commission grant to have a digital navigators team uh, that uh, was able to assist residents with the um, adoption of those devices. That digital navigators team continues in our office as funded through the FCC ACP grant. But for that distribution is something that the um, improvements were there were for the uh, additional use and benefit to constituents. Um, and something that's a key takeaway is um, the, the assurance that there is a um, practice in place to uh, identify those barriers early on. Um, and this will uh, ensure that there is a risk mitigation strategy in place um, for the, the devices. And one of the, the key takeaways is um, for any entity that is looking to have a distribution uh, program, that distribution partner, um, especially from the, the vendor um, partners that are providing the internet services and the devices <clears throat> themselves is key and critical. Um, and this is something that evaluating the, the vendor um, uh, partnership and um, pivoting if needed is a key consideration uh, because at the end of the day, it is ensuring that residents have the ability to not only access uh, the technology, but to um, use and understand how it can be uh, best suited for them. So thanks, Deanne. Thank you, John. Um, John's going to be here, um, or some of our offices are still going to be here till the end. So we, if we've got questions for him, please drop them in the chat, and then um, or to let us know when you get to the discussion um, what those questions are. Next slide. Um, next, I wanted to highlight um, the the importance and the necessity of digital skills. I already see a question in the chat about you know how do you for John that John they had asked, but this Monica, please feel free to answer and jump in here. Well, how do you navigate language and culture barriers? So I wanted you to talk a little bit about the necessity of digital skills and what you you, you anticipate to see with the uh, digital equity cohort, because so many of your grantees are working with people with disabilities, they're working with lots of those covered populations, and they're working with uh, communities where um, English, English is a second language, or it might not be at all, they're just Spanish-speaking families. Yeah. Hi, everyone. My name is Monica Gonzalez. I'm the Digital Equity Supervisor at Methodist Healthcare Ministries. We are a faith-based nonprofit that's really dedicated to pro providing access to healthcare through direct services, strategic partnerships, and grant making. And so although we have been a healthcare organization in funding and supporting healthcare, we know that a person's well-being and health is beyond a doctor's appointment, a doctor's visit. So we've expanded to look at digital equity, food security, and economic mobility. So last year we launched our digital equity strategy is what you see on the slide. So making sure there's a healthy ecosystem in the digital equity um, region and locality and making sure that we have the organizations who can support our communities. Um, and we're really doing that through device access, digital skills, and public benefit adoption. So as Deanne mentioned, we have started, um, we kicked off this past Friday with 28 grantees. And we are focusing in four regions. So the Rio Grande Valley, the mid-border region, um, San Antonio and Austin. So our communities we see there are primarily Spanish speaking. Um, they may be disabled, older, older or veterans. or um, and So really for us, language and culture are really important. So making sure that we have materials in Spanish and English. Right now I'm working with Deanne to translate some Spanish uh, materials into Spanish because we know our communities need that. And that may look different. I think one of the things we've been discussing as a team is, you know, translation services are very important, but sometimes we have our text mex and we need that cultural flair, right? We need to be able to connect to some of these words that may seem like they're formal Spanish, but that's really not what our communities can connect to. So making sure that we're creating materials and programs that um, really surround it, really um, centered on that, those cultural um, importances for the community. So we're bringing together our 28 um, grantees on a regular basis because we want to create a space where they can share these opportunities and challenges and really a place to collaborate. We don't need to recreate the wheels. There is a lot of great examples happening around the country here in Texas and here in our communities. Um, our communities know what their, their residents best and know their population. So being able to share those experiences as a cohort together and this learning journey along with MHM, we're, we're glad to provide that space. And for us, you know, like I said, this is newer, but our takeaways are really looking at 
how do we create this environment where people feel like safe to talk about the challenges and how do we come up with those solutions, but also thinking about that collaborative piece because we know the state money and the NTI money will be flowing soon. So they need to have that collaboration partnership and really in order to be competitive for upcoming grants. So we're hoping that we're creating the space through our digital equity um, grantee cohort. So I'm happy to answer any questions as we move through the presentation. Thanks, Dan. Thank you, Monica. Next slide. Uh, Community-based digital skills training programs. I wanted to remind you all of the covered populations and the sections of the TDOC where you can find um, the information of, with those covered populations. So best practices for des designing effective programs is does it serve uh, cover populations or more? And if you're working with older adults, older adults usually yeah, not usually, sorry. Older adults um, often also have um, you know, problems living with disabilities or they may be unhoused. They could be a veteran. So be always thinking through under the Digital Equity Act's covered populations. You know, does your digital skills solution, does your device deployment solution, um, does it serve a covered population? Um, I'll always be um, thinking about how you could coordinate with those uh, people working directly with covered populations if you not, are not right now. Um, and then also how you can communicate the programs with the covered populations. All of these communication, coordinate, um, are always going to be coming up. Um, I also come to talk a little bit about concerns with older adults and digital navigators. There is a, um, the, what that means is that uh, there is a lot of research that talks about whether or not teens or younger adults should be the digital navigators for older adults. And there is there is research on both sides. So I'm not gonna pick a side for the, this presentation, but make sure if you are working with not just older adults, but any cover population and you're designing what kind of digital navigators, those are the people who often um, help with device deployment or they uh, moderate or facilitate and teach the digital skills curriculums. Make sure that you're rethinking through the, um, you know, those differences of those models and like what's best for your community. So, for example, in San Antonio, when we designed the Senior Planet San Antonio Digital Navigator Program and Device Deployment Program, we took into account Spanish-speaking communities. So we had curriculum designed in Spanish. And we had the device curriculum designed in Spanish, and we thought about um, outside of where seniors are at senior centers where people in the Latino community might convene. And then we also thought about like what sort, what older adult would want their digital navigator to be like. And so the majority, the overwhelming majority of the digital navigators that serve the Senior Planet San Antonio problem, uh, program, they are mostly older adult, and most most of them speak Spanish. Uh, because that is the that is the more successful peer to peer model for that program. Whereas Tech Teen Center, if you remember that program I brought up um, uh, last week, the Tech Teen Center is a hybrid. So they have older adults um, there that go there, but they also have younger adults that are, are trainers and participants. And so the programs can look differently from community to community. Um, there, I've also seen curriculum in Mandarin. I've seen curriculum in Hebrew for Holocaust survivors. So yes, I agree with Monica. There's a lot of stuff out there uh, before you begin to like uh, start all over. In-person community outreach now that we are in recovery for the pandemic um, is key, right? We're, when we say the people on the other side of the digital divide, like these are the hardest people to get to. So someone asked the question that always comes up is how do you get to people that are not on the internet. Uh, you have you. It's that's regardless of using technology, we can't take the people out of this work. Regardless of how many people we connect to the internet, in-person community outreach, promotadoras. There's a model that were like they go out in their community that we use here in Texas. The city of San Antonio actually had um, you know city staff go door to door with information about ACP um, and other programs that are available in the community. There's phone trees, you really like old school community organizing that that person in your neighborhood that's got that phone tree from that recipe group they used to have 10 years ago. Like these are the kind of people that are gonna help you reach the hardest to reach people. And then also whatever, um, whatever you're designing back to the, whether it's the skills or devices, accessibility, accessibility, accessibility. Like if it's not accessible, 
it's 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 not usable for the user. So if your if your curriculum is not accessible, if your device is not accessible, if your internet access is not accessible or affordable, then like you don't have all three legs of the stool, and you don't have um, you know a holistic program that's going to be um, that's going to result in long standing adoption. Next slide. Oh, we can. I think this is a repeat. We can skip this one. Next slide. Um, integrating sustainability, I wanted to talk a little bit about, um, you know, different kinds of programs. Again, this is just an example. We're not going to spend a lot of time on this slide, but uh, the city of San Antonio um, did not only did they work with the school districts get, to get the devices and the other supplies out into the community, they also looked at like long term viability of digital inclusion for like low income communities. And so the Beyond the Classroom project was where the city of San Antonio worked to connect the students in the, the low income neighborhoods to an internet access program. It's a it's a mesh program, it's a Wi-Fi. So they have routers in their homes that connects them, connects the student uh, to the internet. It's rolling out in different phases, but I just wanted to share a picture today. Um, there's many programs like this, not only in the city of San Antonio, uh, there's other programs that we're gonna, we're gonna talk about. We mentioned the city of FAR last week, but their communities are, when they're thinking of beyond ACP as we're calling it now, you're going to have to be thinking about like the accessibility component. So you don't have um, a digital inclusion or digital opportunity program if it's not thinking all three, like the devices, the skills, and the connectivity. So one of the reasons why this Beyond the Classroom project even came to be was that they were deploying devices out into the community and then students were not showing up to remote education. And they, when they surveyed the families and the students, well, why aren't you showing up to class? There were other reasons, but one of the main reasons was that that family did not have affordable internet access or had access to no hotspot or anything. So we always gotta be thinking through. Next slide. Um, building sustainable digital skills programs. Um, there are the, the this, this once in a lifetime funding with that's happening throughout with the federal funding and state funding is, is a huge opportunity for our state. But the, the we can't rely on like that funding to be the solution for everything that we're working on in our community. So you're going to want to be thinking through the longevity of your program. Is it to give an example? Is it a program that you're popping up? for a period of time with a specific covered up population to reach us like an end goal? Or is it a program that you're creating in your community that's gonna be there for the community? It serves now and it will serve the community that comes afterwards. So an example of that is uh, um, 72 out of the 74 public housing properties in Barra County have connected their residents to internet access through um, their, um, like it's, and again, it's like a mesh, network um, that they've built um, throughout those properties. That's huge, right? But they've also have these com uh, community technology centers that provide um, access to devices and to the, the skills program. And if when the uh, resident goes through the program or completes the program, they get a device, great. But what about the next person who comes to the public housing unit or like when someone leaves the housing unit, that program will have to evolve um, over time. It'll probably have to refurbish its devices if they get older. It'll probably have to adapt that curriculum um, if like a larger served po uh, population ends up living at those properties. So those are some things to be thinking through. Next slide. Um, balancing community needs with resource efficiency. What not when when you talk to someone that works around device deployment, a question that they often get is, "Can you just tell us what devices to buy?" So, what kind of device? you buy is going to be dependent on the population you work with. We saw a lot of tablets that went to older adults because that uh, that older adult population, like the, the iPad um, or the smart pad, that, that was the device that was good for them. Uh, if you're a telehealth uh, solution, if you're a telehealth project and you're doing telemedicine, and you're doing digital skills training, the device that you might invest in um, might look different. Um, you also want to be thinking through um, like the mobility, like if you're working with unhoused residents, if um, power versus longevity, 
Like if it's a program that's going to be de deployed in the field, it, you know, would, does that device have the power? Um, does it have longevity? It can also mean, mean like the ruggedness, like if it's something that's going to be deployed in the field. Um, we had these basically like these military style trunks that we had to like load devices up with that we could charge when we were, were away from the classroom, but they were in like a box that could, that were locked up and stored because they had to travel often with like sensitive technology. We actually at, um, at uh, ILSR, we have many digital equity fact sheets. And one of them is about expanding device availability for broadband. This is clickable. And then also there's this other research with um, DigiUnity. Next slide. Um, this is where we thought originally I was going to uh, talk to John so we can skip that one. Next slide. Um, a successful community-based uh, uh, device deployment program. So there are a lot of them out there. Um, I'm pointing to a community technology network today. I think we have Sky on the call. Yes, ma'am. Hi. Hi. <laughs> so we're not going to uh, before we. I've already mentioned Oats from AARP, and um, oh, if you're not familiar with Oasis, that's another program that also serves older adults. Um, can you talk a little bit, uh, Sky, about um, CTN? Like, I know that you're an organization that is um, always thinking about long-term sustainability, but also like you're one of those organizations that people can go to instead of, you know, instead of starting something from scratch, they can replicate some of the successes that y'all have already accomplished. Do you wanna talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. Hello everyone. My name is Sky Downing and I am the uh, Digital Equity Programs and Partnership Director for Community Tech Network. Um, as Deanne said, uh, here at CTN, our mission is to transform lives through digital equity. And we have been doing our work for over 15 years uh, through the provision of direct services or basic digital skills training uh, provided in person, virtually, or in a hybrid learning environment. And through the provision of our digital lift capacity building services. Um, so of course, as with everyone, we had to pivot as a direct service provider in the pandemic. And we, we learned very quickly how to get um, the aging populations that we served online into virtual classrooms. We've taken all of our compiled um, uh, experience and knowledge and we've, we've thrown it into our capacity building uh, um, toolkits that we have built. So we are incredibly grateful to uh, the Methodist Healthcare Ministries team, MHM, for their support of a three-year capacity building initiative in which um, CTN will identify, train, and deploy uh, five digital navigators to assist 10 agencies per year over the three years. Uh, we will, those, those uh, navigators will be distributed throughout the corridor which runs from uh, uh, between Williamson and Bear counties, inclusive of Williamson, Travis, Caldwell, Bastrop, Hayes, and Bear. Um, we'll distribute 750 digital devices. Those are brand new devices um, at a rate of 25 devices to each of the 30 partner agencies over the course of the three years. And utilizing then our digital lift training toolkits will provide training up to uh, 10 agency leaders per, per, per participating, easy for me to say, uh, location with a focus on classroom training or digital navigation and public benefit enrollment um, training, uh, enrollment specialist training. Um, the uh, digital navigators that we deploy will be multilingual and they will off offer support in uh, in person as well as in the virtual realm. Um, in outreach activities, they will support agency sites with dig their digital literacy programs and uh, benefits enrollment activities, um, also device distribution events, things like that. Um, and then essentially they'll serve as the regional capacity building training, uh, as the regional capacity building training partners for those participating agencies. Um, we'll assess each agency's needs and identify um, their most critical training priorities and uh, 
the capacity building training that we provide consists of 15 hours of training provided to each inclusion practitioner um, online over a three week training period that's followed up by a 90 minute workshop debrief where the enrollees review the practical application of the content and real world training scenarios in community together um, in a virtual uh, session. And then Digital Lift also provides resources for learner outreach, intake and assessment, basic digital skills curriculum in multiple languages, regionally appropriate um, information regarding additional device acquisition and internet services and enrollment in a growing community forum, which promotes the ongoing learning and connection beyond the grant funded period. So at the close of this three year period, and again, with incredible gratitude to MHM, we expect to serve 30 partners distributing 750 new devices with the help of the five digital navigators will provide at least 4,500 hours of training to up to 300 trainers who will then serve a minimum of 5,000 clients within their communities. But we predict that this outcome will actually be much greater. Uh, we know that some, some organizations, smaller organizations serve fewer people, um, so that, that count would be smaller. But uh, for the larger organizations that have a, a broader reach, we know that that, that number is going to climb. Um, the overarching goal of which is to empower our Texas partners to increase their greater impact in a sustainable manner within the communities they serve. Thank you so much. Yeah. Just did it all for me. Thank you so much. Um, we can go to the next slide, but I was going to say another good example of uh, community impact and um, long-term sustainability is there. There was a project out of New York City. Um, I think they did something similar here in South Texas that designed a digital um, skills and curriculum and device program for Holocaust survivors. And so what they learned from that project that was also a research project is that what they designed for the Holocaust survivors, which is also, also a storytelling project, was that it could also be used for um, communities living with disabilities, not just older adults, like all other older adults, but also communities living with disabilities. So good stuff for community impact and long-term sustainability. Um, community engagement. Um, Again, always be referring back to like, if you're like, where do we start? Our organization wants to do this or, or your organization is already doing it. A lot of your organizations are already doing digital inclusion work. Be referring to the strategies, objectives, and baselines um, in the um, in the TDOP when you're thinking about your strategies for effective engagement and the importance of involving the community. Like I mentioned before, like if you're designing a solution for a specific community and you're not working directly with them, that would be a red flag. Um, I think it would be a red flag, um, you know, for uh, someone, if you're approaching someone for public funding or private funding. So just be mindful. Next slide. Um, the other question that comes up often about all of these programs is where is the money where, um, and it's not going to be just in one place and you have to, people have to be very creative and also mindful of there's these few resources that are even available. Digital equity is uh, digital equity work, digital inclusion work, the digital divide is an issue that more people know about because of the pandemic, but the sector is still quite new. It's much larger now, uh, but the funding is still not like arriving. And this, the federal state, you know, funding is available, but you should be also working um, across nonprofits with nonprofits, looking at local resources, looking at, you know, city resources, county resources, always be considering building partnerships to apply for larger awards. Don't ever go it alone. Um, be working together. Um, there are public private partnership models out there that you could research and um, look into. Um, there are different donor models. There are different, do like different pooled funds. There are different individual donors. Um, none of this information is being provided today. We're just telling you like, these are the other options that you should be considering. And the other one that doesn't get talked about often is the earned income revenue models that are also available out there. Next slide. Um, also remember that you want to be, um, your, your solutions shouldn't just be we just want to, I, you just want to connect people to the internet um, and you just want to teach them a class, uh, how to create an email, um, how to create an email address. Digital, the reason why so many organizations, all those cover populations that serve um, 
all those cover populations and organizations that are serving them, the reason why digital inclusion impacts those organizations is not because they are a digital inclusion organization. It's because the outcome of their mission and vision of their organization is connected to the barrier of the internet. So health access could be connected to not having the internet, financial literacy, workforce, like employment. So you always wanna be designing programs based on the outcome that you're uh, trying to accomplish. The older adults, the OATS one they've brought up often because it's the one I'm most familiar with. The outcome for OATS is yes, they want um, older adults to en be engaged in the community and be activated, you know, with civic engagement. But they're trying to end, um, they're trying to end social isolation. They're trying to help older adults live longer. And digital, the digital divide is a social determinant of health, of helping older adults feel less lonely and feel more connected. Um, there, we want you to also consider the array of programs that are out there outside of the Digital Equity Act that um, also address uh, this issue. For example, if you're working on a telehealth solution, we gave you an example of the Connect, Connect Care Pilot Program funds devices. So you always would be thinking about how you can thread the public and private funding together to fully fund and sustain your program. Next slide. Um, once again, um, one of the most... <laughs> This is why this uh, slide is so simple. The one thing I will keep saying is like the best way for you to have like, you know, a fully comprehensive whole program is going to come through partnerships and co-designing. Um, if you partner with the people on the ground, if you co-design the solution with the most impacted stakeholders and representatives, you know, your funding opportunities are most likely going to be more sustainable if you put all these things together. It is a very much like a puzzle that we're putting together um, to create a fully fledged um, sustainable program. Next slide. Um, local organizations, if you're a national organization, and you want to work with work in a specific community, and there are many, you want to be working directly with the local communities in that said community. So if you are a foundation that's a national foundation, a national company that wants to you know, give devices to a local community, the, the best practice is to work directly with those local organizations and anchor institutions that have those re, um, relationships. That is the best, best way to sustain, to sustain those partnerships. And it also results in a unified approach to digital inclusion, right? It means um, when, when these things are not happening together, when building par partnerships, what often happens is that the solutions the, the solution that community has in mind is disjointed. So if you consider these three things, most of the time when you're designing your programs, the building of the partnerships part, then there's alignment and a unified approach to digital inclusion. That's why San, I believe San Antonio is a trailblazer like other cities that are on this call today is because they very much have like a unified approach to how to address digital inclusion. And the Texas Digital Opportunity Plan is another example of our statewide unified approach to connecting every Texan. Next slide. Um, this is the, the, the last for this conversation today. These programs have to be monitored and evaluated. You have to monitoring, like, are you tracking towards success? And what monitoring and evaluation looks like um, for your program needs to be decided. And it has to be implemented. I really haven't seen a successful program that doesn't monitor and evaluate. Um, you, I've seen models that have pre, mid, and post survey. I've seen uh, uh, solutions that are connected uh, to research projects. I've seen um, programs that are uh, connected to like um, other forms of community survey design. You always want to be measuring the impact because the collective community impact is the goal of what we're trying to um, get to. And you also want to know if your if your program is being successful because why would you want to continue to make the investments in a program that's not successful? And oftentimes a program might need to pivot. So if you're not monitoring and valuing your program, you wouldn't know where to pivot. So that's why we also as a reminder why we keep sharing the ACP enrollment maps is because if you look at the high enrollment rate, if a community was considering doing outreach in like one area that already had high enrollment, that would not have been a good, that would not have been a good idea. They would want, because of evaluating the information that's out there and measuring what's available, they knew to pivot their community outreach to different zip codes. 
Um, and also your program will need to continue to improve in order to stay around for the community. Of course, our goal is to work ourselves out of the job, but if you're, if you're really creating a community asset that you want to have long-term viability, that's going to be around for multiple participants in an older adult program or a K through 12 program, it's going to continue to improve over time because curriculum improves, devices improves, you know, um, you always want to be evaluating that. Next slide. All right, we made it. <laughs> that was a lot to cover today. Um, so we're going to uh, stop the recording for next. Just a reminder to uh, sign up for the Texas Broadband Development Office newsletter. It's the best way to stay up to date with everything that's going on. Next slide. And we thank you all for joining us today. And here's a reminder about our office hours. And please reach out if you'd like to schedule time with um, ILSR or anybody else. Thank you so much, everybody.